So again, thank you for joining me today. We're going to talk about how to engage underprepared students. And why don't we go ahead and start with um, some introductions and the agenda. We're going to start with just some introductions. We're going to share some strategies for how we can identify students who may be struggling or who are underprepared. Um, and then after that, we're going to take a look at how to understand our underprepared students. You know, how can we relate to them and how can we build a core structure uh, that will enable them to succeed. And from there, we're going to come up with 10 specific strategies that you can employ in your classroom. And of course, we'll have Q&A and a final wrap up at the end. But if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to either hop on the microphone or you can go ahead and type in the chat. So with that in mind, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. So um, if you can, wonderful. Um, go ahead and please type in the chat and just let me know your name, maybe your field, your discipline, or the courses that you're teaching. And then how do you recognize when a student is underprepared? Are there things that you can observe? And if so, um, can you share that with us and, and see if we arrive at the same answers or maybe some different strategies here? So I'll go ahead and I'll pause a moment. All right, Lynn, thanks for being the first one to answer. Let's see. So Lynn is from the School of Nursing. Great. And it sounds like your students complete some first formal posts that are done in a conversational tone um, with chat type abbreviations, um, no citations. Oh, OK. So you're, you're looking at their actual writing. Great. Jessica, welcome. You're teaching comes 100. Some students um, don't know how to help themselves or they aren't familiar with the class syllabi or note taking. Yes. Very true. And Stephanie is from the School of Nursing and you teach maternity nursing and you've taught professional nursing. Wonderful. Um, and when students um, will ask questions that were directly covered in the readings, absolutely. I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce your name. I apologize. Um, is it Tachi? You're teaching PSPA uh, 331, undergrad public administration and political science course. And you know a student is underprepared based on the quality of their engagement in class or if they do not engage at all. Wonderful. So we can look at their writing. We can look at their class participation. Um, we can tell if they are asking questions that have already been covered. Um, and sometimes it's just about engaging with the material, like the, the course itself or the syllabi. Yes, and some students absolutely do need extra help due to their varied readiness. Thank you. Wonderful. So I think we can go ahead and we'll, we'll move on from here. So we, we do want to understand our underprepared students, and we also wanted to develop kind of a working definition uh, for this workshop on what it means when we say that a student may be underprepared. So let's kind of dive into that a bit. 
So I do appreciate how all of you were sharing your tips and strategies for identifying students who are struggling academically. Um, this tells me that either maybe you yourself have experienced what it's like to face a situation where you're not prepared and you can empathize with your students, um, or you have witnessed it firsthand. And the warning signs that your students are struggling are, are present and, and you can actually observe and recognize what's going on. So if we continue sharing these experiences with our colleagues, then as a university, I think we're going to be better prepared to pool resources to help our students succeed. And so part of this is that as we go along and we learn to engage our underprepared students, um, like I said, we want to form that working definition for what this actually means. And that also means providing some sort of a social context to this. And so I wanted to make sure that I gave you um, another definition to work with because um, a significant portion of our underprepared students um, may actually be what we call under-resourced. So again, we have this definition up here on the screen, uh, but we can also take it a step further than that. Um, so one way to think about our underprepared students is to consider uh, that they may have attended an underfunded school or institution in the past, or they may actually be experiencing uh, financial difficulties now, which can also directly um, impact their education. So it can affect uh, their access, yes, to textbooks, like it says up there on the screen, but it can affect other areas of their life as well, such as access to technology, transportation, childcare, or even reliable internet service. And so we wanted to make sure that we identify that a lack of resources can create a barrier to education um, so that we don't fall into assumptions about our students' levels of motivation. So what can we do about it? Well, we want to empower our students and we want to meet them halfway. So if your student is exhibiting the behavior of an underprepared student, then it's important to approach your interactions from a place of positivity. Um, your students may also be experiencing feelings of self-doubt and we want to encourage and inspire them to continue on with their education. So if a student is underprepared, we want to help them recognize that a setback is not the same thing as an insurmountable challenge. So now we have this question though, well, who is underprepared? And as we become more aware of the growing number of underprepared college students, it's kind of natural to ask, you know, what is causing this conflict? But unfortunately, it's not a simple answer. And while it's a well-intentioned question, it can devolve into kind of blame and misunderstandings. Uh, and I also do want to point out, we also may not even recognize the full history um, for each of our students. So um, I do want to provide an example of this so that you can see uh, kind of how it's maybe like the tip of the iceberg when you ask, well, why is a student underprepared? Uh, so one example, and there are many out there, but uh, one maybe where someone may say, well, I think that our college students are academically unprepared because high schools did not adequately prepare them for college. So the problem with a statement like this is that it can present as an attack on our high school and K through 12 educators. And in turn, uh, they would say that, you know, they are adhering to state mandates, they're doing everything within their power, um, but they also may not expect all of their students to pursue a college education. Um, so as you can see, there, it's kind of a multifaceted scenario. Um, there's many different viewpoints on it. And so at this stage, as educators, we are going to be of more assistance to our students if we focus on what we can do in our present circumstances. Okay, so I do want to talk about some of the contributing factors of being an underprepared student, um, but I also want to come up with a definition that we can use of what it means to be underprepared. Um, so I encourage you to think of your underprepared or possibly your under-resourced students as students who are overwhelmed to the point that they cannot strategize the steps that they need to succeed. 
they may want to succeed, they typically do, uh, but they can't envision how to do that. So typically these are students who are going to find themselves in new and unfamiliar territories. Um, one example of this, maybe the most obvious example would be college freshmen because this is the first time that they have physically been in a college classroom. So they may not be prepared for the rigors of higher education. However, there are many other students who may find themselves feeling underprepared. Um, this could include, though it's not limited to, your transfer students, returning students, um, students who switched majors or maybe just recently declared a new major. Um, this could be first generation college students um, and, and so on. So with all these different factors involved, when we talk about reaching out to our students, um, we also want to help our students self-identify warning signals um, that they may need to kind of regroup and possibly ask for assistance. All right, so now that we have kind of this working definition of what does it mean to be underprepared or under-resourced, um, Let's take a look at some of the contributing factors of why a student might be underprepared. When we think of warning signs for students who are struggling, uh, we can look at three probable factors. And a student may not exhibit the skills, the knowledge, or the behaviors necessary to succeed. So when we talk about the behaviors, they they may, name, they may not have anticipated the time commitment that's going to be involved. Um, this could be particularly um, prevalent if they're falling behind in their coursework that they do outside of the classroom. If we're looking at our students' um, skills, skills are things that we can build upon in class, uh, but we do know that our students progress at different rates. Um, and so sometimes we may need to look at ways that we can help them practice and to improve those skills. Um, and then we also have the foundational knowledge. Um, a lot of times this goes back to, do our students have the um, basic skills necessary? This could be reading, writing, math, uh, things of that nature. Um, but it can also mean, did they, did they miss a piece maybe on one lesson plan that's a building block for the rest of the coursework? Um, so we also need to see what piece of information are they missing so that we can fill in those gaps. All right, so I do have now um, some different techniques and strategies. I think I've got about 10 of them here that we can look at specifically that we can use in the classroom. Are there any questions before we move on? Okay, sounds quiet. So now that we have kind of this working definition of what it means to be an underprepared student, we can take a look at the strategies for how we can improve the course structure to engage students. I think this is going to be particularly helpful now as we are kind of embarking on a new semester uh, because there's plenty of places where we can implement some of these uh, strategies. So when we think of compiling a list of resources, you may already have a section for this in your syllabus, um, but there's also this opportunity to expand. So, by all means, please do include information about you know, the DRC, accommodations, or even potential tutoring options, uh, but then open this up for class discussion. And so one thing that I like to point out is that you know, during this pandemic, I've been very impressed by NIU's faculty. I've worked with instructors who included resources such as uh, no-cost mental health services, information about food pantries, and even free internet hotspots. We know that if our students can get their basic needs met, then they're more likely to engage with their coursework. So similarly, you could take it a step further and ask your students to anonymously contribute suggestions to add to the list. Um, if you're doing this through Blackboard, you could even set up an anonymous survey or an ungraded assignment. And you can ask your students to contribute resources that they've found helpful. And you can introduce ideas you know, to kind of get them thinking about this. Um, such as you know, academic coaches. How are academic coaches maybe different than tutoring? Uh, 
um, open educational resources, um, services that may be free and available online, services they can find through NAU, surrounding communities, um, library resources, all sorts of things. But if your students have access to some of these resources that they maybe didn't even know existed, uh, they may be more likely to stay engaged with all of their coursework and potentially not even just your course, but uh, all of their classes. And it's a great icebreaker activity. It's something a little bit different probably than um, some of the standard ones. So creating a schedule and discussing your expectations. Now, I know this can sound um, pretty generic. It may be something you're already doing, but there's some other um, things that you can include when you do this. Um, creating a schedule with your students is a great way to help them manage their time. Um, this is an activity that you could ask them to do during the first couple weeks of class. It doesn't necessarily have to be graded, um, but again, it's something that um, you should ask them to, to fill out. And you want to be honest with your expectations. I have seen in some syllabi where instructors will use kind of a generic calculation for how much time they anticipate students will need outside of their their course you know for study time um, but you can actually try to tailor it and and make it your own and so one way to think about this is um, you might tell students that they should expect to devote three hours per week outside of class um, to reading the required text my mind went here just because my background is in teaching english um, but again you know think about your own discipline and, and typically what are some of the assignments that your students will be doing um, but again, think about this as how can your students uh, fit this into their schedule. Some students may read at different paces and also not every week of the class has required reading. So with this in mind, you can tell your students um, that there are going to be some weeks where they're going to have a heavier workload than others. Um, and then you can ask them to think about this in relation to their, to their own unique schedule. How does it fit in with their home life activities, other coursework, their work duties? Um, this is particularly beneficial if you are working maybe with college freshmen, returning students, or even transfer students. Um, but if you ask your students to take an introspective look at their schedule, they may realize that they need to deliberately block off their calendar and set reminder alerts to stay on top of their tasks. So an example that I can give you that has actually occurred is there is a returning student who had a job as well as family obligations. And initially he said he would complete his homework in the evenings. Um, but he ended up deciding that this did not work well with his schedule. Um, he, he thought it was a little bit too distracting. And I believe he was also a little bit exhausted because he was trying to cram all three hours of reading into one sitting. So instead, um, after looking at a schedule, he was able to block off his, his lunch breaks to find a quiet place to go read. Um, and so he was able to do this by, you know, breaking up his schedule into manageable sections. Similarly, uh, when you're discussing your expectations with your students, um, consider outlining the behavior and characteristics of what does it mean to be an A student, a B student, a C student. Um, and I know this can seem arbitrary, but it can help dispel this idea that attendance is equivalent to participation and satisfactory performance. Um, ask your students, how much work do you think you need to complete in order to get a C in this course? You may be surprised what answers you get. Um, so if you use grading rubrics, for specific assessments in your course, consider creating a separate one just for the overall class itself. What do they have to do to, to score a B in your course versus an A? Um, this can actually kind of help students realize how much work they're going to have to put in. All right, and so now when we actually get into the coursework, not just the preparation, not just the beginning activities, but now that we're actually starting off the class, you may want to start with some low stakes assessments. And a positive way to begin any course is to start with either small or zero stakes assessments, your choice out. Um, 
but by starting out small, you've incorporated opportunities for students to boost their self-confidence. Um, as they begin testing out their skills, they'll become more willing to experiment and ask questions. If they feel their course grade is not in jeopardy of being compromised, um, they're more likely to volunteer information. They'll, they'll be more likely to, to participate. So one way that you can begin a course is to start with a pretest, um, and you can use it as a diagnostic for yourself as well. Um, but this lets you know um, your student's skill level and knowledge level coming into the course. This will give you kind of a, a baseline. You'll be able to establish if there are some major gaps where you may need to backtrack. Um, and it'll also let you know if there's any type of consistency among your students. You may have students who perform all across the board on this diagnostic, or uh, you might find some pretty static results. So it's nice to know where your individual course stands. You can also revisit this information later with a post-test. You can gauge how much progress your students have made once you've implemented your lesson plan. You can also do this on a smaller scale. So you could use pre and post tests for specific lesson plans for, you know, if you have one week where you're going to uh, present a whole bunch of new content and you want to know how much of this did they already understand or have maybe even a, a working knowledge of at the start of the, the week and then at the end of the week, um, how far have they come? Did they retain any of that information? Did it sink in? Uh, so you can use it for your overall course, but you can also use it um, incrementally as well. You can also look at your grade uh, breakdown in your course. And so as you can see up here, I kind of started a chart where you can um, take a look at how your students are looking at your course. Um, typically, if they have a lot on their plate, and let's assume they do, um, and they may decide where they need to exert their most effort. If you only have one or two large assessments, uh, they're not going to maybe engage as much or, or work as hard on some of the smaller projects, even though you may think they're, they're valuable and important. So instead, you want to start to kind of look at what is your course made up of? How many assignments are there? Um, I think on this screen you can see journal reflections, labs, presentations, discussion boards, tests, homework assignments. Um, you're going to want to try to make these fairly evenly um, spaced. You, you're going to want to see if you can make these um, percentages. Um, I don't want to say uniform, but you don't want any huge spikes. Um, if you have something that's worth 50% of their grade, um, you can imagine that from the student perspective, that's where they need to focus almost all of their attention. If they get that 50% uh, of their grade, you know, really strong, and maybe a couple of other small assignments, um, then everything else, you know, doesn't um, hold that same kind of engagement for them. So this is a good way to kind of look at it is, are they going to have to continue to exert effort throughout the duration of the course or is it peaks and valleys? Um, so this is something that you may want to play with a little bit. I apologize if that didn't come out quite as clear as I wanted. Um, did that make sense at all? Let me pause for a second here. I haven't heard from anyone. Okay, great. All right, so moving on to that, something that you can do for your students, uh, because it is a working relationship, when our students are underprepared, there are things that they're going to have to do on their end, and there are things that we're going to have to do on the instructor end. Um, so part of this is just committing to a, a grading routine for our students. Um, in instances where students may not realize that they are underprepared, uh, this can almost come as a shock to them. Uh, you want to build your course so that you can address this as early as possible. Um, ideally, you want to avoid having a student walk away from a large stakes assessment uh, shocked by a low grade. Um, so again, that's where some of those 
early low stakes or zero stakes assessments comes in, uh, they can kind of use that as a knowledge check building up to one of these larger pieces that they'll need to complete for the course. Um, but they also need to be able to see their grade, right, so that they, they know um, in a fairly quick turnaround time how they're doing in the course. So these are some things that you may want to consider um, putting in writing. So are you going to need two, three, four, five days to grade? Whatever is reasonable for your schedule will be reasonable for your students, as long as there's some kind of semblance of order. Um, you can curb a lot of student anxiety uh, by posting your grading response time in your syllabus. And if students have ample time to practice, such as by working through some of those low stakes assessments and they have time to review your feedback, um, then they should feel more prepared to go on to those future larger assignments. So again, these are just some things that you can think about. You know, what is your late work policy, but also how quickly can you grade late work? Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, it does help to provide this information so there are less questions about the grades. Um, you know, things like, when are you going to respond to emails? I, I never realized how, how big of an issue that is for students, um, but it, again, eases some of that anxiety. If you have other commitments and for whatever reason you can't return emails on Thursdays, um, that, that's probably a good thing to note. Also, how frequently is the gradebook updated? Um, this is something that you, you may want to check in with your students about, particularly if you use weighted grades. Um, a lot of times you don't weight your grades until all of the assignments are in. Um, so, so you need to check in with your students to make sure that they understand um, where they're at, you know, academically, how they're progressing. Um, they, they usually want to know what their grade is. Uh, periodic points throughout the semester, and so they're going to want to know where do they see that reflected. We also want to build our pedagogy so that it promotes practice. As we encourage our students to study and build their skill sets and budget their time, uh, we also want to focus on their mental preparations. So oftentimes our mindset can largely dictate how we approach new challenges. And we wanna be mindful that our students actually may possess the skills and knowledge that they need to progress through the academics, uh, but fear can actually be holding them back. And test anxiety is a great example of this. So it can sabotage a student's best efforts and we wanna create an atmosphere where a setback is not viewed as detrimental to their education. So, you want to create specific instances where students have an opportunity to revise and retry their coursework. Um, can we let students revise every single assessment? Probably not. Your grading workload would be through the roof. So you want to be strategic about the opportunities where they can you know, choose to revisit some of their work that they consider of poor quality. So one way to do this is to consider letting students choose which assessment they would like to revise. You can provide guidelines for what a revision should include and specific examples to help set that tone. Um, another option is you could tell your students that multiple attempts are allowed, um, but some instructors have mentioned, well, if I tell them that they can revise, then the first draft that I get is always, um, you know, kind of thrown together, you know, not very thoughtful because they know that they have a second chance. So if you want to avoid that situation, something you can say is that if you need a second opportunity, you may do so, um, but I'm going to average together your two scores. Um, so this is another example of, of how to remind your students to be cognizant of of each of their attempts, um, but to understand that one attempt is not the final, you know, verdict. Um, if students know that every attempt counts, then they'll kind of have a clear picture of how they need to budget their time as well. So 
we want to create opportunities for our students, um, but we also want to maintain that academic rigor where they're challenged each time they submit something. So it's a little bit of give and take, uh, but you can actually come up with something that'll work for your unique classroom. So what do we mean when we say keep it relevant? Um, if you have never heard of it, the term andragogy deals with the specifics of the best theory and application for how we teach adult learners versus pedagogy. Um, even though we kind of use that uh, word even in higher education, pedagogy, the root word there actually means the, the best way to teach children. But um, when it comes to andragogy with teaching our adult learners, one of the um, key takeaways here is that adult learners need to know why they're learning what they're learning. Um, it has to serve a purpose. And they also need to know how it connects to their, their other coursework. So to help your students build these connections, um, I, I do suggest asking some open-ended questions. And uh, the other part with dealing with adult learners is you want to make sure that uh, you give them options and choices because they they do have uh, a lot of skills already built up and, and they want to be able to utilize them effectively. So an example here is that if we looked at some geology students, they may need to analyze a series of mineral deposits and write a lab report. Now you could begin by asking them, what is what is your previous lab experience look like? Um, ask them, you know, how did you set up your laboratories? Um, what was your methodology? Uh, did you have to write a lab analysis? And then from there, you may ask them to consider this assignment and the steps that they're going to take. You may need to prompt this. Some of them will automatically come up with some different strategies. Um, but will they do this lab analysis first and write the report later? Are they going to take notes alongside the analysis so that they can more effectively do their lab write-up later? Or will they do a write-up after each individual lab analysis? So you can discuss the pros and cons to each scenario, but then you can explain why these might might be useful skills that they can use um, later on in this very same course within the program or even in the field. Another option um, is to help keep your students engaged by um, asking them to, to choose their topics of interest. So for those same geology students, you could create a pool of options for them to choose from and you can ask them uh, kind of to propose their own topics or you could ask those geology students to pick seven out of the 10 mineral deposits um, that you have provided and, and they get to do their analysis from kind of from a pre-selected pool, if you will. Or you could even ask your students to go out into the field and to locate seven different rock or mineral to deposits to analyze. Um, and then they need to take pictures or you know, I mean, if this was something, if they, we were out in the field and maybe it wasn't, you know, below zero, um, you could ask them to uh, scrape up a little bit of each of the mineral deposits um, and to submit it along with their analysis. So again, we're, we're treating them as adults. We're giving them options. Um, you can refine those options a little bit. You can give them parameters. Uh, but again, it's this idea that we're going to instill some choice into our course. Um, and we're also going to make sure that our students understand why we're asking them to complete these exercises. All right, we're on to our seventh step. So we're, we're doing well on time here. Um, when we talk about fostering communication with our students, there's two primary uh, relationships that we're going to work on as instructors. Um, and we need our students to make these connections um, and to establish these relationships so that they feel connected to their coursework. So the first type of relationship that we're going to help them build is the relationship with their peers. Um, and then, of course, the other relationship that we're going to try to develop is the student-teacher relationship. So we're going to try to set the, the groundwork for it. And we're going to have to hope that our students, yes, will meet us halfway. Um, but when it comes to helping our students connect with peers, you may want to consider pairing unlikely combinations of students together. 
So um, I know during this pandemic, as we've been doing a lot of remote teaching, if you were using one of the web conferencing platforms, whether it was Collaborate, Zoom, or Teams, um, you might have used the breakout groups for group activities. Now, a lot of those are randomly assigned, which also works. Um, but another way to think about it is to start off with um, a little bit of a survey. Ask your students a question. You know, give them six different options and say, if you wanted to research one of these topics, what would you pick? Once you get the survey results back in, try to pair your students with somebody who has a different interest. Why? Because they may think differently, they may have different backgrounds, uh, they may have different niche interests within the field, um, and, and so it kind of gives a level of diversity to these group combinations. Um, you could also randomly assign students together, which uh, works well for the um, breakout groups. And another option here um, is you could give your students the option to sign up for groups based on topic. So if you do want them to pair together uh, with people who have similar interests, um, they, can, they can sign up that way. Since Stephanie said you also found the Yellow Dig discussion board platform has been a great way to encourage engagement. Yes, so that is a new discussion board tool. If uh, some of you are not familiar with it, that NIU has purchased a license for. It's kind of rooted in gamification principles where students earn their points uh, based on how they wish to engage with the discussion board. Uh, for instance, if they post early and post often, they can accrue more points than if they wait towards the end of the week. Uh, that kind of a thing. And uh, my other um, student-teacher relationship that I mentioned before um, is also a form of communication where you need to ask your students uh, to identify their goals. So again, this is an open-ended question. Um, what do they want to get out of your class? What motivates them? Um, you might also ask them to break down their goals on a smaller level. So what do you want to get out of this research project, the course module, the class discussion board, etc. Our students have different goals, so it's important to recognize um, that what one person would consider, you know, uh, a good outcome, somebody else might be disappointed with. Um, so when you ask these goals, um, ask them to periodically revisit their responses. You know, did they achieve their goal? What went well? What wasn't so good? Um, or have their goals changed entirely? So as you communicate, you can learn more about your students as individuals and they'll probably be more likely to reach out um, if and when they have questions. So you can do this again um, through a written context or if you like to do um, you know, mandatory office hours. This could be um, a nice itinerary for, for your students as they come in and they get to speak to you face to face. And then we also want to do some kind of frequent check ins uh, along the same lines as, you know, forming that student teacher bond. Uh, but frequently checking in will prompt students to initiate the conversation. Um, whether you do this face-to-face, -face, online, uh, it could be in a hybrid modality, consider requiring your students to write down um, a one to two sentence reflection each class period. Uh, this is actually a tip that I, I picked up from a faculty member at NIU. And so they would ask their students to pick up a slip of paper every day as they walk through the door. And then before they left, they had to submit their paper again um, and again, you have options on this. You could ask them to put their name on it and it will count as their participation for the day. Um, or if you think that they'll be more open and honest with you, if it's anonymous, you could, you could do it that way. Um, but their students would have to write something down on the slip of paper every single day before they left. And they had three questions that they were allowed to choose from or, or three writing prompts, I should say. So you could ask your students, what is something interesting that you learned today? What are you confused about? Or what has sparked your curiosity? 
So this can kind of help you as an instructor measure your own success on a smaller scale. Um, if everybody is confused about the math equation, uh, this could be a, a tip that, you know, your next class period, you may need to revisit it, or you could email your students additional resources, you could post an announcement to clarify it. Um, and so it gives you an opportunity to um, address some of their concerns, um, or it can uh, actually inspire you to maybe um, answer something unexpected. You know, what sparked their curiosity? Uh, this might actually give you ideas that you had not previously considered. I also want to mention, um, as far as frequent check-ins go, that you may ask your students to submit um, their own self-evaluations periodically throughout the course. And I like to do this for written assignments. And again, yes, I know my background is in English, so maybe I'm biased. Um, but I, I like to mention that uh, when you do this in a written format, students have an opportunity to write down their thoughts. Uh, they can they can edit it, they can plan it, they can revise it, and it becomes a low pressure environment for communication as opposed to, even though we, we still wanted some of that, you know, face-to-face -face contact, um, sometimes it's harder for them to, to open up to you um, when, they, when they have to make eye contact. So I, I do wanna be aware of of that um, and the different modes of communication that we offer our students. But um, in any event, when you ask your students to uh, do a self-evaluation, um, ask them to identify, you know, how do they evaluate their progress? Um, what was their what was their methodology that they used? Um, did they have one? <laughs> um, did it go as anticipated? Um, was it easier? Was it harder? Um, and also ask them to evaluate the, the final end product of whatever this project was. Um, did, did it satisfy their expectations? And the other option that I, I encourage you to use is to leave a blank spot um, where you can say, is there anything else you want me to know? Um, and this works especially well like I said, in written assessments because some students may not feel comfortable um, talking out loud when they when they give you this information. Um, I've had students tell me that you know they were very nervous about an assignment, um, that they they do not speak English in the home. Um, so you know you you never know uh, what type of information they would like you to have, even if they don't necessarily volunteer it in class. All right, we've got two more. So this one, um, you know, create uh, some type of interactive, creative, or challenging activity. And I think most of us will agree that when you enjoy your task, you're more likely to finish it um, and give it your best effort, but the same can be said of your students. So if you engage your students, uh, which is not quite the same thing as entertaining your students, um, but it, you can help them um, look for ways to get involved. And so the rule of thumb that I like to use on this is to look at your weekly activities. For instance, if it's a 16 week uh, course, then we can look at it as 16 different opportunities um, where you can go ahead and you can insert some type of an action verb, right? So I'm gonna say, look for moments where students can take charge of their own education with these action verbs. So. If you don't know where to begin, um, try this. So you could say, this week students will, and here are some examples, build, present, explore, compete, analyze, create, solve, produce, et cetera. And I have three different examples that I would like to give you here because I'm going to ask you to participate in the chat here in just a moment. Uh, and all of these are actual um, activities that have happened in a course. So for instance, there was a health course uh, where, where students were studying um, a unit on infectious diseases. And a lot of this involved memorization. Well, memorization can be kind of boring for students, if you will. Um, it's, it's not maybe as stimulating as some of their other uh, units, other activities. And so the instructor really wanted to to kind of 
make that a little bit more memorable, right? If they can find a way to engage with this information, they're more likely to retain it. Um, so the instructor asked students to come into the class and one by one, uh, she would ask them to turn around and she would uh, tape the name of one of the infectious diseases on the student's back. The peers then uh, had to give them information, which they couldn't look up, so they were already supposed to know this, about the symptoms, the diagnosis, or the treatment of the disease. And the student with the card taped to their back um, had to identify their disease in a certain amount of attempts. If I think after two or three attempts, if they could not identify their disease, they had to go um, back into the line to see you know, which card they drew the next time. So, you know, it, it is kind of um, a memorable event, you know, when, when you're wandering around with infectious diseases taped to your back and people are trying to describe it to you. Um, and, and I think it actually, um, she said it worked out really well for the, the course. Um, there was a, a lot better scores on, you know, terminology than there had been in the past. So that's one example. Another example comes from marketing students. Um, they, they were doing well in their courses. Um, they, were, they were still doing the coursework, but um, they seem to have kind of lost some of their drive and enthusiasm. So as just an activity, just to kind of get them, you know, engaged and invigorated and, and, and ready to work, uh, the instructor decided to implement something um, kind of lighthearted. And so students were um, put into groups and they were assigned a random product and they had to come up with a new slogan or tagline for the product on the condition that they could only use um, a popular slogan from um, a pre-existing product. Um, a jury was then brought in to vote on the most creative slogan and the winning students were allowed for selection in the next activity. So, I'm trying to remember what they used. Um, I think there was something where they swiped the slogan from uh, KFC, finger looking good, and all sorts of, of, of interesting um, examples of, of where they were actually using contemporary contacts um, in a new and unusual manner. And then our third example is also from a, an instructor here at NIU. And history students were studying a particularly volatile time in history. Um, and so the instructor asked them to write an apology letter on behalf of the government for the atrocities committed against innocent people during a time of war. Um, and so students had to think about what would they say, how would they address those who were wronged by the government, um, and also in their letter, how would they um, commit to altering their behavior moving forward. So again, these are all different types of activities. You don't necessarily have to make them graded assessments. Um, this could just be something that you bring in sporadically throughout your course, um, just to stir things up and to, to make it a little bit unpredictable for your students. So on that note, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Do any of you, and please feel free to type in the chat or to turn on your microphone. Um, but do any of you have certain activities that you found that are really engaging for your students? Uh, I'm sure you do. So if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your own creative activities that you use to, to kind of get your students excited about their courses. I'll pause just a moment. Great, Lynn, that's a wonderful option here. Um, if you're still typing away in the chat, please go uh, keep going. Um, but Lynn anticipates that some of her students, um, particularly those who are new to asynchronous learning, may have trouble understanding um, that online classes uh, take a certain amount of dedicated time. Um, so there's a learning curve to, you know, how, how to take such a course. And let's see. Great, she's monitoring their progress. Um, that's 
looks like there's some revision opportunities, um, and also sending some of them to the Writing Center with an extension for a rewrite. Fantastic. I love it. You're, you're incorporating some of those resources that are available to our NIU students. Anyone else have a, an activity that they would like to share that they use in their course? Thanks for attending, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to move on. If there are some other uh, suggestions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Or if you have a particular sticking point in a course and you're looking for suggestions, you can always ask your peers here as well what they might do to encourage their students. All right, and we are down to our, our last one, um, which is all about providing examples. So a great way to clarify your expectations is to make sure you incorporate examples of what you expect from your students. Um, but you also want to include some examples of what you want your students to avoid. So you may want to bring students into the conversation as, as you present these examples. What is it specifically that makes an example a good example? Is it the format, the organization, the level of research, um, the demonstrated analyses, uh, the creativity, um, the attention to detail? What is it that makes this such a great example? Um, next, you're going to also want to take a look at some of the mediocre or poor examples of that same project. So where did they fall short of the mark? And, and then ask your students, how could this have been improved? You can use examples from previous semesters. You could, you could kind of fabricate or create your own examples. Um, you could use some similar work that maybe your colleague has collected from their course, um, but just try to keep it anonymous and then focus on how would you grade it. You can even turn it into an activity and ask your students uh, to grade it and see, you know, what was the grade that they gave the the project versus what was the grade that was actually received on, on an actual assessment. This can be kind of eye-opening for your students. And then when we go ahead and we provide these examples of coursework, the trick here is to moderate both your tone um, and also the types of examples that you provide for your students. So you don't want to focus entirely on what you dislike. I, I can honestly tell you I was in a professional development seminar and I remember looking at all of the examples. There were 10 examples provided. Only two of them were what they considered good examples and the other eight were things that they told us to avoid. Um, it, it was very discouraging. It, it was not a, a positive and uplifting tone. And um, I was looking at far more things that I shouldn't do versus what I should do. Um, so again, I would say you should have roughly equal parts of things that you want your students to do um, and you know, equal parts things to avoid. Or honestly, you should maybe have a few more um, examples of things that meet or exceed your expectations as an instructor. So again, it's all about your tone. Um, tell your students that they can succeed um, and then lead both example on that. So I know we've got about five minutes left here. I'm available for Q&A wrap up and I'm gonna go ahead, I'll turn off the recording. Are there any questions that I can answer for you?